in and of itself. Um, uh, I'd like to call them up and I'll, unless Clara has another idea, I'll call them up in the order in which I uh, have them. Uh, and uh, the first speaker on my list this afternoon is my colleague Milena Gomez, uh, who will uh, talk to us uh, about the Colombian, are you ready, Milena? Uh, about the Colombian uh, diaspora community. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Clara for inviting me to participate in this conference on uh, transnational Latin Americanisms. I'm actually thrilled to be here today because I'm a product of the urban planning PhD program here. So I'm homegrown and I spent several years ago many times back there taking notes during classes. So it's a thrill to be here um, actually on the podium. Um, uh, for today, I wanted to go through four discussion points to share with you a lot of the work that I did in my dissertation. To start out, I want to give you an introduction to how I encountered the issue of remittances and housing investments in Colombia. Second, give you a snapshot of um, the importance of remittances in Colombia. Oh. Give you a snapshot of the importance of remittances in Colombia and the story behind remittances and housing investment. Second, I wanted to share a few of the findings, the key findings of my dissertation regarding housing investments and how remittances and housing investments have impacted public policy in Colombia. Last, I've been working on this topic for about four years, so I wanted to share some ideas that I have on remittances, housing investments in Colombia and transnationalism. I first heard of remittances in 2003, and I have a confession to make, I had no idea what it was. But I wasn't alone because in Colombia, very little research had been done on remittances. We had no idea who was sending the money back home. We had no idea what the money was, where the money was going to. Um, so all we knew back then was that million, billions of dollars were being channeled back home with little information of what was going on in the, in the business market. So in 2004, when SIPA asked me to teach a, an MPA public um, workshop, I decided that'd be really interesting to structure my course on trying to understand the remittance industry in Queens, in Jackson Heights, Queens. So after the course, I realized that um, I was totally captivated, hooked on the issue of remittances, but I had a second problem was that I wanted to study the issue of remittances for my PhD, but I could just tell that my faculty would say, what are the planning implications? So I struggled with that until the fall of 2004, the Colombian, um, there was a Colombian housing fair that took place um, in New York in the fall of 2004. And that's when I decided how interesting I can connect remittances to something related to my dissertation. Um, so, I noticed in the housing fair that there was a lot of excitement and a buzz among the immigrant community of buying a home. Everybody was talking about, oh, I can buy a home back home. Something new that hadn't been discussed 10 years ago. And at the same time, I noticed the same excitement with construction companies and banks trying to reach out to the immigrant market that they hadn't really thought that it existed. Uh, so they, I somehow saw this, um, the interest of the businessmen in Colombia, like the, in the past years, the treasure seekers looking for guacas in Indian tombs. All of a sudden they thought, oh, those guacas might be abroad in immigrant communities in Europe and the US. So um, then I got, you know, I decided this would be an interesting topic to follow because very little knowledge was known in this field. This was 2004 and there was much to be learned. I had to learn and also the government and the construction and business companies had a lot to learn. For example, um, there were no procedures. The government hadn't set up any procedures to send money legally to Colombia for the purchase of real estate. Banks didn't know how to um, offer credit to immigrants, how to offer mortgages. So there was a learning process that we all had to go through. 
Um, I remember in the housing fair in 2004, I bumped into a student of mine from Colombia, and she showed me two checks. She said, Milena, I have two checks. I don't know what to do with them. Can I deposit them in my bank account, or will I be accused of money laundering? Mm -hmm. um, nobody knew. So um, it wasn't until January of 2005 that the Colombian government set, uh, set up an account, number 1812, within the balance of account balance of payments to send money legally from abroad to Colombia. Um, so that's why I say 2004 was a turning point. It was a turning point for me, and it was a turning point for the research that was generating. Everybody realized there were millions of dollars, billions of dollars coming into the country, and nobody knew what was going on. 2004, there's an influx of research, articles in the newspaper, Journals in Banco La Repúblicas, uh, or journals such as Reportes al Emisor, Tendencia Económica, articles in Portafolio, Semana, everybody talking about remittances and maybe of the dream of, of having, of seeing or making them productive. Um, in addition, in 2004, five surveys were commissioned. Uh, we're on the next slide. Oh, it's me. <laughs> uh, okay, so 2004, there were s five surveys commissioned, two by the International Migration Organization. Together, they partner with Colombian organizations, Colombian uh, government organizations like the DIME and the Foreign Ministry. One done by Fe Desarrollo, an economic think tank. RCN, a radio station from Colombia, interviewed immigrants in Florida to find out what they were thinking and Ben Dixon Associates, Associates made a, a survey on Colombians as they've done with other countries in Latin America and presented the findings um, in an IDB-sponsored conference in the fall of 2004 in Cartagena. So there was still a lot of buzz in 2004 regarding um, trying to figure out what was going on in this market. Regarding my research on remittance, I've spent from 2004 to 2008 trying to figure out what's going on with the housing market. So I not only reviewed all the literature um, on what was being written back then, but I interviewed pol public policy um, decision makers. Um, I attended five of the 15 fairs that took place in New York, New Jersey, Miami, Madrid, and London. Um, and I also did a lot of work on the internet. Um, just to give you an idea, over 80 construction companies have participated in these fairs. And I reviewed what they were selling and um, also followed the news from Camaco, the housing construction lobbying group. Um, and so in five years, we have some information that helps us figure out what was going on in this market. Um, To give you an idea before talking, oh, these were the pictures I took from the fair in 2005 and 2006. As you can see back then, there were lines of Colombians trying to get into the fair. Um, they were very crowded back then. They've uh, lessened since then. And this was an idea snapshot I took of the, you know, they're divided by regions. These were the photos taken in the Antioquia region, but you'd find that for every region in Colombia. So a, big, a, a little snapshot of the importance of uh, remittances in Colombia. Uh, in 2008, $4.8 billion were sent to Colombia. Um, we're the second largest uh, flow after Mexico and Brazil. And just to point out, in 2008, the remittances continued to increase to Colombia, even though the news was showing that remittances had decreased in other countries of Latin America. Remittances in Colombia account for 2% of the GDP, which is much lower than other countries. We're, we heard from this, more, uh, this afternoon in a previous comment that El Salvador and Honduras um, receives their GDP, the, about over 10% of their GDP um, depends on remittances. Colombia doesn't really depend on the remittances as much as other Central American and Latin American countries. Um, we're still talking about a very important flow it's second to oil imports and derivatives in the export. I'll, I'll, I'll show you a, a graph in, in a few moments. And more than 36% of the flows come from the United States, which differentiates the Colombian case from the Mexican case. 
the following chart shows the increase in remittances over the years. And before you ask me why the increase was so dramatic after 1999 and 2000, I think I'd like to explain why. I probably shouldn't have included the information prior to 1999 because it's a bit hypothetical. Because in Colombia at that time, there were strict controls of foreign exchange. So all the money being you know, exchanged was done in the black market. So it didn't go through the regular channels of the legal channels. Uh, 2000 or 1999 to 2000, the thing changed. The Banco de la República, the central bank, um, included new forms of bookkeeping, imposed new forms of bookkeeping. Las Casas de Cambio, which are the money exchange um, offices, fell under more scrutiny to the Superintendencia Bancaria. So they made any transaction of over $500, you had to you know, legally declare it. So of course, uh, there was more money being accounted for. But more importantly is that dollars became legal in Colombia. You didn't have to rely on the black market. You could open an account in dollars in the bank and exchange dollars, and obviously, the numbers went up. Last and not, but not least, in 1998 to 1999, 2000, there was an enormous exodus of Colombians leaving the country. Um, and that uh, they were leaving because of security issues in the economy, and so they, of course, were sending remittances back home. So that explains the, the steady increase um, from 2000 onwards. With respect to exports, as you can see, the line, the yellow line, shows the money coming in for remittances. It's three times the value of coffee, the traditional Colombian export product and obviously not as high as oil, import, oil exports and its derivatives. Now, this is a graph that shows uh, the money coming in legally um, by way of the account 1812 for purchases of real estate. So my point is that it's, you're, you're seeing a general trend, a steady trend going upwards, maybe going a little bit downwards in the past couple of months, but that's probably caused by the recession. This, the, the quantities coming in legally through account 1814 represent 4% of the total volume of remittances in Colombia. But that doesn't account for the money that families send through the regular remittance channel, channels that according to the surveys and studies that have, by, have been done to date represent 4 to 5%. So we're actually talking about 8 or 9% of all the remittance flows going into housing investments. Okay, these are three of the main findings of my dissertation, and this shows basically why the Colombian case is different or unique from others. First of all, from all the surveys done to date, it shows that remittances are an urban affair in Colombia. The money being sent abroad goes to urban regions in Colombia because the immigrants come from urgent urban regions. Obviously, logistically, this money, if you're, gonna, if you're coming from an urban region, you're gonna buy a home in an urban region. So it reveals that 95% of all the homes sold um, in Colombia are in the main cities. Uh, basically, Bogotá, Cali, Medellín, but also in Armenia, Barranquilla, Cartagena, and Pereira. A second interesting finding is that most of the homes being, or the money being channeled through the account 1812 goes directly for new housing. And that sort of depends on the type of, the, the type of businesses. Only new housings are sold in the fairs, and only um, new housing are sold in the internet. So if you're an immigrant in New Jersey and you wanna buy a home back home, well, you go to the fair, you see new homes, and, or, and then you check it out on the internet, so, used property and home improvements are not really in the market. So I have a map to show you, which shows this, the offering of sales in the Bogota, in the capital of, of Colombia. Um, and it basically shows that immigrants are buying property where the new developments are springing up. So it just, the you know, sales of property mirror urban developments in Colombia, in Bogota, in the main cities. 
This map shows the stratification, the type of homes that are being sold. Um, the yellow shows expensive property, estrato cinco and seis, you know, the high, the expensive property, and you can say that there's not much of an offering for expensive property. The red uh, reveals vis housing, vivienda interes social, which is low income housing, which is also not really in the market for immigrants. Immigrants are really buying into estrato three and four, um, which are the mid-level prices. A cost of uh, an apartment or a home in the estrato three and four would be actually around forty to fifty-five thousand dollars. Those are the that's the niche. That's the price that apartments are selling. And I imagine many of you will be asking me, well, you know, what type of home can you buy for that money? It's here in New York, you could probably renovate your bathroom with that money, but you wouldn't be able to buy anything. Um, in Colombia, with $50,000, you can buy a nice two-bedroom apartment in a middle-class neighborhood. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of the success. And that's also true for uh, apartments and homes being sold in Bangladesh and the Philippines. Money goes a lot more in these countries than here. This is, I just, uh, this is a typical apartment that gets sold um, to immigrants living here. It's a nice, uh, nice construction. Uh, these are the type of homes that are sold in the fairs. You know, people here dream of having that home. home. They could probably never be able to afford that here in the States, but I just wanted to show it because I saw it in the fair. And this one, which is a condo in Cartagena, was shown in the fairs, and actually I said, oh, I'd love to have a condo in Cartagena. <laughs> so, um, but you know, for $100,000, you can have your dream home in Cartagena, and some people, some people have made money and they can really afford it. Um, but I just, it impacted me, so I wanted to share it with you. So now, um, how the whole process of remittances and, and, and housing investments have impacted uh, public policy. I think the most important impact that remittances have had on government is that it's reconnected the state to immigrants. Before the Uribe government, um, immigrants were ignored by pul public policy makers. Um, I, for my dissertation, I reviewed all the memoirs of the foreign ministers that were sent to the Congress since the 70s, and only two talked about the importance of reaching out to immigrants. Most of them, or all of them, talked, when they talked about the work of the consulates, they were talking about uh, how many passports were sold, the visas sold, authentications and certificates. And the efficiency was measured on the number of passports sold, but no mention was made about reaching out to the immigrants living in Spain, in the States, or you know, or Alaska, whatever. Um, so, so this is a big, it has been a, a, a big change. The Uribe government adopted, um, because of remittances, I think, adopted reaching out to, America, uh, to immigrants as one of its important goals, and they started the Colombia Nos Une program. And in the Colombia Nos Une program, one of the basic um, programs is selling homes to immigrants. And I think that's a key that why this program has been successful. Um, I have to, two minutes left. Uh, why it's been successful is because um, the government has supported the fairs and it's also supported um, not just with participating in the fairs, but just President Uribe and the ministers go to the fairs. I went to one in 2005 and President Uribe was there. He has rock status among the Colombian immigrants here and he kept on asking the fair, who's going to buy your house? And everybody would say, hi, mi presidente, I will, I will. So, so that type of support and with the seal of government approval helped jumpstart this whole process. The housing industry is also, um, is also vital for the development pro programs of the, of the government. So selling homes is a good business for the government um, because employment provides employment, five or six percent of all employment in Colombia depends on how the construction business, it gives economic opportunities, and it uh, provides, it helps out with the quantitative and qualitative deficits in the housing stock in Colombia. I'm gonna skip a few things. 
Uh, okay, so to conclude, I would say that research to date should suggest that there exists a healthy demand among immigrants to invest in this real estate back home. It's not a huge amount. We're talking about $200 a year, but it's an accomplishment. And if you add up all the money that has been sent since the account was started, it's over $744 million, which is, it's, it's money that wouldn't have been there if, if they hadn't started the whole process of selling homes back home. There's a quote from Guarniso, Professor Guarniso, that mentions that um, remittances are definitely a symbol of transnational behavior. And I just wanted to add and take his remarks a step further and just basically say that um, not only sending remittances, but investing them in a home back home is demonstrating even tighter bonds transnational bonds with your hundred, so you're putting money, you're investing, you know, um, even in, in any amount is a huge investment. Um, so real estate investments are an, an important indicator for transnational, and I, I'm suggesting that investment in real estate will score higher on the transnational litmus test than buying a telephone card and calling or visiting your grandmother on, on holidays or eating an arepa when you're in Connecticut. So it's just because money talks, and I think showing a big investment represents that you're um, interested in remaining connected to Colombia or to your country of origin. And lastly, I'd like to say that immigrants come to America in search of the American dream. And now I think this definition of the American dream, I would incorporate that part of the American dream is including a home back home. Um, it's a new way of seeing the American dream. Um, and also because it's becoming, for immigrants nowadays, it's becoming very difficult to find the American dream here. So it's easier to find it with a home back home. And this is true from the research I've done, not just for immigrants wanting to buy in Cali or Barranquilla, but also in Bangladesh and the Philippines. You talk to anybody, everybody dreams of having a home back home. And lastly, I would just say that um, the government's participation in this whole business has been successful, and they basically prospered from incorporating immigrants into their national public policy. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much, Miriam. I was extremely enthusiastic um, with your uh, paper and with your uh, Descriptions of such beautiful homes available for 50000 but then you said the one that I want in Cartagena is $100,000. So I a little bait and switch there, but we look forward um, in the Q&A and the discussion with Miriam to look at sort of what, you, you've given us a case study of the housing industry, but sort of the broader linkages between diaspora communities and their home and that kind of sort of trans-nationalism that results there, um, as we've seen a glimpse of it through the housing market, but it has broader linkages and broader dimensions that maybe we can discuss. So thank you very much, Melina. I, I went against, I had an older uh, format, so I want to warn the authors, I'm going to go back to the authorized format and order in which you're speaking, give a moment to catch your breath, but I, uh, I uh, would like now to read, I'm going to be calling Miriam Chion up uh, now. Um, uh, Miriam, uh, if you would, Miriam, um, uh, you've got her bio in our program. She has her doctorate degree in city and regional planning from Berkeley. Uh, if you've read her paper, which I assume you have, on spaces of multiplicity in cosmopolitan Cusco, you would have thought her degree was in anthropology. Uh, but uh, so, far, so she is a very multidisciplinary person. Uh, her bio says she's an assistant professor at, uh, of international development and community and environment at Clark in Massachusetts, but I believe you've changed since then and are back in working in city planning in, in San Francisco. In any case, uh, welcome you and uh, look forward to your paper. Well, buenas tardes. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. And um, I want to approach the framework of transnational Latin, Latin Americanisms through the construction, the production of spaces of multiplicity in cosmopolitan Cusco. I want to um, explain and explore how not just the resources and the multiple uh, influx of people from all over the world intersect, but also some of the cultural forms 
that lead to very specific uh, construction of places. And as Clara indicated earlier um, today, this is an intellectual inquiry, but it's also um, uh, a political statement in terms of the, the types of development, the path of developments that one can pursue in this context of transnational Latin, Latin, Latin Americanism. Uh, I am with the Association of the Area Governments right now, enacting uh, uh, my own transnationalism. In other words, bringing the knowledge of Cusco, Peru to inform some of the planning processes in San Francisco. Um, I would like to first go and give you a quick overview of some of the ongoing development trends in the city of Cusco. Then uh, review some of the recent the reason, uh, conceptions of cosmopolitanism to then rethink how we can um, approach the concept of rooted com cosmopolitanism to understand what's happening in Cusco and what are some of the development options that can open up. In terms of um, Cusco, as, as you already know, Cusco uh, um, is located in the southern highlands of Peru. Um, it, uh, it's a regional uh, form was, uh, had the shape of uh, Puma, the original Inca city with the head defined by the fortress of Sacsayhuaman and the body shaped by two creeks, Sapi and Tuyumayu. It is a city that carries, um, it's located in a valley and it has expanded uh, along the valley and as you can see uh, towards the mountains as well. It carries a very important history as the capital of the Inca civilization that is expressed on the walls, on the streets. Um, it also represents a major place for some of the colonial architecture through the churches and plazas. Uh, but even more interesting is how that history is carried through some of the ongoing cultural activities, uh, dance, music, festivals, as well as the way the bread is made or sold uh, or exchanged. Um, now, because of this heritage, Cusco has been an important place of tourist activity. It's not new. It's been at least in place in this more or less current modern form for a century. But what it's very dramatic is the growth that the city has experienced in the last 20 to 30 years. And, and I'm taking a very low point of uh, during a period of economic decline. But even in the last uh, 10 years, the number of tourists per year have increased. And one important point to recognize here is the way in which some, some of this tourist growth took place, how it was shaped by the work of the local, the municipal government uh, right before this rapid expansion. So beyond the scale of the growth of tourism, what's, what's also important to understand is how this tourism is unfolding in the city. For the first time, uh, the city allowed the opening of a McDonald's in the main plaza. It's, not the, it's the first fast food outlet international franchise. Uh, very upscale, organic restaurants, and expensive hotels. This is Hotel Monasterio at Plaza Nazarenas, completely renovated. Uh, the rooms are here. Uh, the most expensive one go up to um, $1,900 per night per room. Yeah, so you go through a very <laughs> wide range. Uh, you can buy an apartment in, in Cartagena for a few nights at this hotel. Uh, the chapel, again, that has been uh, fully renovated uh, is now used as, uh, you know, space for business meetings and, um, and conventions. Uh, and so the whole setting in terms of the, the lifestyle has acquired a different, um, a different dimension. <laughs> now, because of the growth in tourism, which is not unique to Cusco, I'm sure, you know, across all our places we're seeing that, uh, but it's just that in Cusco uh, it, it, it gets amplified, the trends are amplified. One of the concepts that, being, that people have been playing around, that we scholars have been playing around, is the concept of cosmopolitanism. Is that a concept that can help us understand some of the ongoing trends? Uh, not just in Paris or New York, but also in places like Cusco, uh, that, as you can see, cover a really wide spectrum 
of places and activities. Um, in, in exploring, there, there's a common sense of what uh, we mean by cosmopolitanism. is some exposure beyond your own home boundaries, some understanding of cultural diversity, but there are some specific concerns that come with this form of production or this specific concept. Uh, and um, they have been called out by various scholars. Uh, the elitism that is produced as cosmopolitanism is produced by or is led by a traveling class with a high level of resources. The commodification of activities and places so that those are acquire an exchange value that is detached from their specific realities. If you find a girl with a yama at the city of Cusco, that is created for the tourist to, to, to capture a picture that has a particular value, not that it relates to the life of that child. In terms of homogenization, some of the level of comfort that we pursue as we travel, whether it's a fast food outlet like McDonald's or whether it's a certain type of wine or a certain type of uh, salmon and sushi that you expect at a hotel, whether you are in Cusco, in Beijing, or in New York. So that kind of homogenization that makes places more alike um, and secures a level of comfort for this cosmopolitan population. Now, there is a slightly different um, uptake on cosmopolitanism. Uh, this term, rooted cosmopolitanism, um, apparently an oxymoron, was coined by Appian in 1997. And he attempts to reconcile, or at least to connect, some of the local realities with the global flows. And he proposes to frame this process of co rooted cosmopolitanism as one that has local roots but engages in global flows. And as an experience where uh, one can take pleasure from the presence of the other at home. One very important point, <coughs> excuse me, that he recognizes is that we can recognize the other as different, but at the same level of power, which is an important point to understand the construction of some of those places like Cusco. However, it lacks the specificity to understand how does this actually happen on the ground? How do you recognize it when you see it, or how you build it if you choose to do so? And for that, we, um, I go into the concept of um, spatial multiplicity proposed by Massey, um, a geographer. And this concept help us recognize some of the dimensions that then can give us uh, some more grounding in the construction of places like Cusco. So on one hand, there's a recognition of the coexistence of cultures and identities. Uh, we don't have to fragment it, or one doesn't have to come in sequence after the other. They coexist in the same place. Uh, the second point about the collective production of places that form relations, and relation is crucial to the construction of places. That is the focus about how one can recognize space beyond the immediate territoriality, which is the main point of what we're trying to articulate here. And the understanding that spaces are dynamic, are dynamic, are always under construction. We cannot uh, separate a particular territory and detach that from the ongoing processes that are transforming the, the place itself. So by taking this, um, this, this spaces of multiplicity and layering with the rooted cosmopolitanism, um, I want to explain or elaborate how that, uh, how that takes place in the city of Cusco. And here, some of, the, some of the specific points that I'm raising really came out, out of uh, uh, conversations and dialogues with, the, with a wide range of actors in Cusco through a community development studio that I uh, ran a couple of years ago, and in particular with one of the doctoral students, uh, Mary Lahorn, who really informed the construction of some of these ideas. Uh, so there are three specific points that I take can help us understand how this rooted cosmopolitanism is produced in the city of Cusco and how these are choices that can be made. 
a value on aesthetics, openness, and spatial commitment. So I'm going to take you to uh, a few cases that illustrate how that unfolds in the city. In terms of the arts and crafts, um, the, the city of Kusu is well known, as I was saying, for some of the um, uh, crafts that they produce. There are these religious um, um, figures with the long necks that evoke uh, the llamas and alpacas uh, that belong to the Andean region. Um, Maestro Lave, the, the only survivor of his generation, creates this um, baby Jesus with an ornament that is very typical of the Cusqueño tradition. Uh, and these this artisans produce at this point for, by commission for museums across the globe. Originally, it was for local consumption for part of the religious festivities, but they produce at a whole different scale. Uh, here we have Josefina. So in terms of weavings and textiles, uh, this is a woman that not only takes pride in, the, in kind of uh, sharing or selling her products, but showing how they are produced to some of the visitors and explaining the meaning of some of the designs. And even one step further, her sister-in-law has opened these shops, one in Cusco and one in New Haven, Connecticut, very close by if you're interested in checking it out. And they run these ongoing workshops to uh, on rescue some of the traditions that are at risk of being lost through uh, more um, kind of industrialized forms of production, but also to kind of recognize the importance of some of um, the, the symbols and, and the qualities of the production process. In terms of the openness, I want to show you a little bit um, the qualities of the place, the openness of some of these spatial practices through some of the drinking activity in the area. This is, drinking is an old tradition in the region. It's nothing that has been imported. It's, it's ingrained in the Cusqueño culture. There are the chicherias, and if you can see that little red flag that indicates when the place still has chicha to serve. And that's a fermented um, corn drink that is served in large glasses. In, mo in most cases, very simple places. Uh, in some cases, it's accompanied by spicy food. And uh, in most cases, it's accompanied with all kinds of music. Now, in recent times, in recent years, there has been a proliferation of different kinds of eating and drinking places. And you can see you go, we go from a sushi bar to this Middle Eastern uh, place, to North American places, to this Cuban uh, bar, to this French club. Uh, to some of the quite popular Irish pubs. And this is a new layer, but it, it's a new layer that has been nurtured or opened up by a couple of places that have been, a couple of bars that were in place in the city for about 30 or 40 years. El Retablillo was a bar opened by John or Johncito, as they call it locally, uh, in, the, in the 70s as a place of gathering for locals and foreigners alike. Uh, as a place of just entertainment, intellectual exchange, political organizing. And so this kind of form, the, the fact that this ex-Peace Corps volunteer created a space where there was some mingling beyond the transaction, create a different form of uh, nighttime entertainment. Now, even more dramatic is the case of um, Macondo and the Fallen Angel. Those are places the, that were opened by Andres Zuniga, a Cusqueño, who, who was trained and educated in Europe, spent quite a bit of time, and in spite of all kinds of family advice, he decided to return to Cusco and became openly gay and uh, wanted to create these queer places, places that are respectful of all people, but in particular of queer population, uh, which in a city like Cusco, with a very strong religious Catholic sentiment, is quite a bit of attention. But here we find something that is not, uh, this does not belong to an international franchise. This is not even something opened by a foreigner. It's opened by a Cusqueño, but 
a Cusqueño that has captured all kinds of influences and recognizing different dimensions of his own experience. And the place, he's an artist uh, and pays a lot of attention to the artwork in those places and the details and the ways in which um, the workers relate to the customers. Uh, so the point here again is to understand the, the openness that comes from the locals as well as the foreigners and the intersections that take place. Now, one very specific, um, and, and getting more into kind of the physical construction of the place, the spatial commitment. I want to show you the, the case of a cafe in a neighborhood. And by spatial commitment, I don't mean a particular object that is fixed in time, a fortress, uh, an archeological site, but how the collective engages and appreciates the qualities of a particular place because of its content, because of its meaning. As you know, plazas are very important throughout Latin America and, and beyond uh, for all kinds of uh, special festivals, but as well as part of the everyday life. Um, we have heard about that a little bit. And this is the main plaza. You have the cathedral in front. And next to the cathedral, there's a small building uh, with a cafe that it, it has been, or it was very important to the everyday life of of Cusqueños and foreigners as well. Cafe Ayu, very simple cafe. And there's nothing special as you can see. These are the two workers and they serve all kinds of uh, hot drinks and pastries. Uh, this building owned by the Archdiocese of Cusco um, was the um, Starbucks came with a proposal to pay a higher rent. They were current, they were paying $3,000 per month, which is a lot of money again, if we just look at that in context. Um, given the proposal of Starbucks, the Archdiocese asked for $10,000 and 10% 10 of the business revenues, which was way beyond what this kind of small operation could afford with all the support that um, it had. So uh, there was an immediate threat of displacement that triggered a major um, international campaign. There was this campaign, Save the Cafe IU, and this is just one of the pages where uh, this was, uh, uh, that conveys the sentiment of people across, across the globe, from Asia to Europe to South America to North America, uh, sending a message that this should not be allowed. Unfortunately, the cafe uh, was closed a few months ago Fortunately, it got relocated a few blocks from where it was, and Starbucks has not been able to open. There have been several serious threats about physical violence, and it remains to be seen what happens with that place. Just quickly, Barrio San Blas is, um, is uh, one of the quaint neighborhoods uh, with narrow streets uh, that has retained a lot of the architecture. This was one of the places that uh, received major investments from the local government for remodeling the streets, some of the public spaces, lighting, houses that got renovated. Uh, and of course, that kind of expanded or fueled some of the tourist activities, travel agencies, um, souvenir shops. What's interesting about this neighborhood, in spite of some, some of the displacement that is going on, given the increase in property values, as people uh, take over some of these properties that still retain some of the local elements, the grocery store, the neighborhood oven where people can bring their goods to be baked, the street vendors or the tamalera at the corner that are enjoyed by locals and foreigners alike. And you can see, for example, even in this building that is crumbling on one side, a souvenir shop and on the other side, just a clothesline uh, you know, from a family that just finished the laundry. So what's interesting about this place is the ability of, re of the ability of locals, residents. And when, we, when I say residents, it's not just Cusqueños of five generations or 10 generations. Now residents in San Blas includes people that has just arrived to the city of Cusco. Whether from South Africa or from Chile or from Argentina or from Lima, they have appropriated the place and they care about the character of the neighborhood and retaining some of the qualities as well as nonprofit organizations, as well as the local government. And there's a concerted effort to try to retain some of the qualities and amplify 
uh, some of the elements that they cherish about this neighborhood. So concluding, there are these three forms of spatial practices, uh, valuing on aesthetics, openness, and spatial commitment that I'm proposing to understand the construction, the production of rooted cosmopolitanism in Cusco. And this production of rooted cosmopolitanism is, is one dimension of the growth of tourism, which is no going to stop, at least not during my lifetime, except for this, right now, this intermediate period that Machu Picchu has been closed through due to some major flooding. But um, all facts indicate that this will be going through a quick recovery. So my point here is that this production of rooted cosmopolitanism is not going to stop some of the global corporate investments, is not going to stop the production of secluded and homogeneous places that get created uh, by various actors, or uh, erase the instant consumption and disposal that comes with tourism. But my proposal is by acknowledging the production of rooted cosmopolitanism, we create development choices, development choices that address the social and spatial justice and recognize the histories and cultures and identities of the city of Cusco. Thank you very much. Thank you for another very excellent uh, uh, presentation. It reminded me of that first visit in the 60s, uh, 1960s I should add, uh, to Cusco, maybe before some of the work got started. And I met one of the young uh, children dressed in, in traditional uh, costumes and I asked to take a picture and she gladly agreed to do, to do so. And I thought this was an example of my charm at work and my Spanish was really better than I thought. And as soon as the picture was taken and a charming smile produced, uh, the hand went out. So I think what comes out to me as an economist looking at much of what Medium has presented to us is uh, how entrepreneurial these people are and if given a chance to participate in media and in their own development, uh, they, can, they can really develop this concept of rooted uh, cosmopolitanism to which I'm grateful to you for that concept. Uh, James, I haven't uh, met yet James yet, but I'm gonna call, ask you to maybe take your place. Uh, James Freeman is next, and um, uh, from what I have of your background, uh, Professor Freeman is a lecturer still at Concordia uh, in uh, University of Montreal. Uh, has his degree also from University of California, Berkeley. So there's something of a, something to, I'm onto something I think there. But his, uh, uh, James did it in geography. And, and most importantly for us, he spent a very, what appears to have a very productive year doing research in Rio de Janeiro at the UF Jota there, in which uh, uh, no doubt contributed to the production uh, of his uh, paper on uh, this uh, wonderfully iconic uh, neighborhood of Ipanema uh, global and local in uh, post uh, countercultural neighborhoods. I don't think I've, uh, I've uh, uh, I'm sorry, the formal title is If the Name of the 1960s, Global Bohemia in a Latin American Metropolis. So, so this is again a paper to look forward to. Welcome, James. Okay. Yeah, so actually I changed the title, so it oh, wasn't no. your fault. <laughs> Um, the, the old title was actually a bit more snappy, but this one's more descriptive. Um, what I'm talking about here, so Ipanema is an is a elite beach neighborhood in Rio de Janeiro, and I'm talking about Ipanema as a post-1960s counterculture neighborhood. And let me say a little bit about how I arrived at this. Um, I grew up in San Francisco. I studied at Berkeley for many years. I lived in uh, Kreuzberg in Berlin. And then one day I arrived in Ipanema to do field work, and I, I looked around and I said, there's something familiar here. Um, there's a common thread. And, and I started to think that maybe um, there's something like a, a post-1960s counterculture neighborhood, that there's um, some sort of something left over, some sort of culture that gets perpetuated over time. And so I set out to study this. And what, what I want to argue is that, um, that the 19... There, there was a moment in the 1960s, particularly 1968, where there was sort of a global convergence, where uh, there was a, you know, a global youth counterculture movement, and there was a series of uh, urban revolts in neighborhoods around, uh, in cities around the world, uh, you know, Paris, of course, and Prague, and Mexico City, often accompanied by severe oppression. Um, 
And uh, so I want to kind of explain this, this global moment. And what I'm arguing is that, um, that this was a collective product, that this was produced um, in a series of urban neighborhoods around the world, and that it had um, significant urban consequences. Um, so, um, and so what I want to do here is make an argument about how, how global culture works and how culture travels. And, and we all know this story, but this is a, this is a, a concrete case where I've, I've thought about this a bit. Um, and I want to argue that, you know, the global bohemia of 1968 was really a collective product that was a lot of places were contributing and consuming and producing. Um, but that there is a certain inequality uh, between North and South, for example, that, um, that we can talk about uh, an unequal cultural exchange, maybe a certain kind of cultural dependency, um, but that at least in, in Rio and Ipanema and in Brazil, um, who were on the receiving end of, of this global culture in a lot of ways, that uh, people very consciously uh, borrowed and assimilated ideas and picked and, picked and choose and uh, integrated them into long-standing local traditions and uh, deploy them in a completely different context, in a, in a very different rebellion. Um, and so where, where does this 1968 moment come from? Uh, it's a long story and I'll try to make it brief, but um, there's a global economic moment. The post-World War II um, economic boom was, was pretty universal around the world and it had different consequences in different places. Um, but it, certainly in Europe and North America, it meant, um, a vast growth of middle class living standards and particularly a, a, a large growth in student population. Um, the other part of it is a global sort of political moment where, um, uh, you know, after World War II, there's an interest in, uh, in democracy and self-determination and there's, there's a rise of third world nationalisms. Um, and then of course we have Vietnam. Uh, and so this, this inspires rebellion around the world. And then there's a, a technological story where uh, this is a moment of, of capitalist expansion, of course capitalism continues to expand, and technological innovation. And there's innovation particularly in uh, transportation and communication technologies. It becomes, the world becomes a much more global, much more uh, tightly knit place. And people are moving around much more freely and, and culture and ideas are moving around much more freely. Um, and of course there's a global entertainment industries are developing in an unprecedented way. Um, and so, for Latin America, there's a regional context, and the most important thing for Latin America really is the Cuban Revolution, where the Cuban Revolution, um, this is a bit of an anachronistic usage, but it showed that, that another world is possible, right? Um, and so it was very inspiring for, um, for young people in Latin America. You know, Latin America had industrialized dramatically, it had urbanized dramatically in this period, um, but in a very unequal way. And, um, the Cuban Revolution offered uh, possibilities and hope for a lot of people who wanted to change things, particularly young people, intellectuals, people on the left. And it represented a serious threat for the United States, for, um, for the right in Latin America. And so you have this moment where there's, there's political possibilities and there's severe oppression going on at the same time. So this is a, a general Latin American condition. Um, and then in Latin America, you have a big growth in students as well. And so just to tell you about Brazil, in 1960, there were 36,000 places in universities for students. Uh, by 1968, there were 90,000 places for students. Um, but there was also a dramatic growth in an, the excess student population. So that meant that um, there were a whole lot of people who were qualified uh, to get into the university but didn't have, uh, there were no places for them in the university. So in 1966, there were 65,000 left excess students in Brazil. And by 1968, the peak of the student rebellion in Brazil, there were 125,000 excess students. And so, I mean, students are not the whole story, but, but they're an important part of the story. Um, they're people who have a certain amount of leisure and they're creative and they're thinking and they're coming together. Um, and in Rio, um, they're concentrating, uh, they, they, are, they are the producers and the consumers of the counterculture. They are the artists, they are the intellectuals, uh, they are the poets. Um, and, <coughs> Ipanema was the center of this, of this, uh, of this counterculture movement in Rio. Um, <clears throat> and I should say the important context in Brazil also is that in 1964 there was a military coup 
And then from 1969 to 1973 was the hard line of the military dictatorship, so a serious crackdown on any sort of opposition. Um, but this was the period of, of Brazilian counterculture and, of, of, and the, the golden age of Ipanema. So we're talking basically 1960 to 1973 is the golden age of Ipanema when Ipanema becomes one of these counterculture neighborhoods. Um, and the story is that prior to this, the 1920s through the 1950s, Copacabana is the cosmopolitan neighborhood. It is the place to be in Brazil. Uh, it, is, it is worldly. It is cosmopolitan in the sense of high status and, and worldliness. Um, movie stars from all around the world are landing in Copacabana. Uh, but Copacabana kind of spilled over into Ipanema. And this, this kind of allows me to start with, uh, to, to talk about culture kind of with a capital C and talk about some cultural production. And one of the important movements that founded Ipanema was the Bossa Nova movement. So Bossa Nova is a style of music I'm sure you're all familiar with. And the Bossa Nova, Bossa Nova dates from the, the late 1950s and really until the early 60s. And the Bossa Nova mu musicians were playing in, in Copacabana and entertaining um, in, Co in Copacabana nightlife. And many of them started, you know, around 1960, started moving to Ipanema to, uh, to find cheap housing because it was on the edge of, um, of Copacabana. And so this is, this is really the colonization of this neighborhood by uh, a bohemian class. They're hanging out in, in bars in Ipanema. They're hanging out on the beach in Ipanema. Um, and they develop a certain a style of beach use and bar use and public socializing. That becomes very important for the, the development of Ipanema. A second movement is the Cinema Novo movement, uh, Brazilian cinema movement, which, is a, which was sort of an avant-garde movement of the same period, drawing its inspiration from uh, Italian and uh, French avant-garde cinema. Um, now, both of these movements have been charged with being derived. Uh, particularly, Bossa Nova has been accused of being Americanized, uh, grafting American jazz onto Brazilian samba. Um, and I want to make an argue about, argument about culture that is a bit more complicated than that. Uh, Bossa Nova was, it was clearly a movement to modernize Brazilian movement, to, to escape the past in a lot of ways. But it very conscious, it was inspired by, um, certainly by American pop music and by jazz. But um, it very consciously and very carefully reworked Brazilian rhythms and created something absolutely new. Um, and so there's ways that it's, you know, it's part of international culture. I mean, the way these people are dressed looks very 1960, right? Um, and the same thing with Cinema Nova. It's, it's, um, you know, it's drawing inspiration from, uh, from French and Italian film, but it's focusing on uh, Brazilian themes, uh, poverty, underdevelopment, right? Um, now let's see here. <coughs> and then I want to talk about a third kind of cultural production. And this is a, something that maybe doesn't register outside of Brazil very much, but uh, a group of people called the Festive Left, and this was a group of people of the same generation as the Bossa Nova and the Cinema Nova, Nova crowds. Um, and they founded two very important institutions. So this is a group of um, mostly journalists, some connections to other, uh, other sort of artists and intellectuals. And they're associated with a particular bar, Jangaderos, and a particular spot on the beach, Montenegro. And um, they, had, they were starting to assimilate some of these international cultural trends of hedonism and uh, sort of um, uh, kind of lifestyles that were going against the, the dominant norms. Um, and so they were hard drinking, uh, you know, partiers, bohemians. Um, and they created two very important institutions that, that I think, you know, they're, they're very local and very global uh, in different ways. The first one is the Banda Jipanema. And the Banda Jipanema is a carnival group. And it was founded in 1965. Um, in the wake of the, of the military coup of 1964. And so um, this is a, a group of guys initially who would, they would dress like this with uh, you know, boater hats and, and jackets and parade through the neighborhood pretending to play instruments because they didn't know how. Um, and they would parade past the bars and try to get their friends to join. They would pay, parade down the beach and particularly try to get women in bikinis to join and parade down the, uh, the streets with them. Um, and they would do silly things like 
trying to ride a, a donkey into a bar. You know, and this is, of course, a very urban place. Um, and so they, they, they developed this style of zany humor that really became identified with, with Ipanema. Um, and the second movement is from the same group. It's called Pasquín. And Pasquín, the, the global roots are a bit easier to trace. It, is, uh, it was an underground newspaper. And it was inspired by underground newspapers in places like Berkeley and uh, all around the world. Um, and it was really developed in the wake of the coup within the coup, in the, way, in the wake of the, um, the hardening of the military dictatorship uh, in December 1968. And um, it, uh, you know, it, it's, it's humor, it's cartoons, it develops, uh, it, it writes in slang, and you can, you can really see the influences of things like, you know, Freak Brothers, Underground Comics, and, and Mad Magazine, and things like this. But um, it develops a, its own language, and uh, it, it ends up you know, being, this, uh, being the largest circulation national newspaper at some point in the, in the, in the 1970s. Um, and it particularly thrived during the hard line of the military dictatorship during the, uh, when, when it was under censorship. So this is what this, uh, this image represents because the, the, um, these artists uh, derive great pleasure um, of submitting a subversive message despite the censors in, in very subtle ways. Um, but, uh, so I want to engage this argument that, that Brazil is a receiver of culture and that it's, it's sort of, um, has a, a relationship of, of cultural dependence. Um, and I want to start with a couple of anecdotes. The first one is that in January 1968, Mick Jagger and Marian Unfaith Marian Faithful, uh, visited Rio and they were hosted by members of the festive left by some of these journalists who took them around. And what is interesting is the, the clash of cultures between these two groups. So the, these, these journalists are wearing uh, you know, coats and ties, and they're meeting, they're meeting Mick Jagger, who is, he's got long hair, he's got a floppy hat, he's got uh, one of these, you know, these leather shirts with the, with the fringes on it. And you know, Marion Faithful and Mick Jagger are talking about LSD trips, and they've got this sort of uh, new age philosophy going on. And so this is the comment that one of these journalists made about this moment. He said, um, how can we reconcile our Christian upbringing with that torrent of shocking information about a counterculture that hadn't landed here yet? So hadn't landed here yet. Like it has to arrive a couple years later, right? And then um, Pasquin had a column called Underground, the words are in English, um, which reported on counterculture movements in other parts of the world. And this column was initiated in 1970. And this is a comment uh, from the journalist who wrote the, regularly wrote this column. Um, I had first-hand information because a Pasquin reader named Jacques, who had, uh, who had gone to study in Berkeley, uh, had gone to study in Berkeley. He sent me what came out in the alternative press. He was in California, the birth, birthplace of the whole counterculture thing, near San Francisco, where the beat, where the beat poets were. He sent me the publication, uh, publications, and I put them in the column. Brazilian counterculture was influenced and copied to a large degree from abroad. I don't believe there would have been a counterculture movement in Brazil if it hadn't been uh, invented by the Americans. Um, and so I want to disagree with him. And I want to argue that, uh, you know, yes, certain forms were borrowed, but it was absolutely different. Um, and so I want to talk about counterculture proper in Brazil, which really starts to look like hippie culture around 1971. Um, and it's particularly associated with a, a, a spot on the beach called the pier. And the story of the pier is that Ipanema was booming. It was going from low rise to high rise during this period. And the city government decided to build um, a, a sewage pipe that would take all the sewage from the neighborhood and send it th uh, four kilometers out into the, into the open ocean. And so in order to do this, they had to dredge um, and they had to make this pier. And so the dredging uh, meant that there were huge piles of sand piled up on the beach, which normally doesn't have prominent sand dunes. Um, and so people would go to the sand dunes to hide behind the sand dunes to smoke marijuana, right? And this is sort of the beginning of the pier, and the pier becomes the hippie counterculture place. Um, this is also the moment of, of Tropicalia. And so Tropicalia is another Brazilian musical movement that some of you might be familiar with. Um, particularly associated with Caetano Veloso, Gilberto Gil, and uh, in this case, Gal Costa is an important figure. 
because she hung out at the pier regularly for at least a year. Um, and so Caetano and Gilles were returned from exile because many Brazilian intellectual artists, leftists, were in exile during this hardline phase of the military dictatorship. Um, and they hung out here at the pier. Uh, and so the pier, in some ways, looks very much like hippie counterculture anywhere. But, um, but it's being, but it's being uh, grafted onto this, this long-standing beach tradition, um, which you know, in, in some of my work I've traced back uh, you know, to the 19th century, even. Um, and, and it's being deployed as a rebellion against this hardline phase of the military dictatorship, which does not allow any real open rebellion. So it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting context. Let me read a couple of uh, quotes of descriptions of the peer during this period. Um, Young people with different heads who wanted to change the world with different weapons than those used by the guerrilla movement. A crowd that loved the Beatles, Stones, Hendrix, Cream, Caetano, Gilles, and the Who. And then a second commentary. The pier became the hippie beach of Ipanema. Great open air underground. The fashion at the pier was long skirts with belly buttons showing and Indian tunics. There were people who went around dressed in Saint Tropez pants, overalls, and even ponchos. Under a sun of 40 degrees, rarely did they, did they enter the water. One did not shave the armpits. Many girls were proud of their triumphal tufts. People greeted each other with kisses on the mouth. It wasn't a beach, it was an attitude. Uh, and another, I have several of these quotes. Another quote, the dictatorship continued to be re very rough, but on that piece of seashore, people cultivated a democratic culture. One breathed or tried to breathe freely. Then you found, uh, there you found beautiful, free, light and loose people. There was a, for, uh, it was for, there it was forbidden to forbid. This is of course a slogan from the May 68 demonstrations in Paris. Uh, the people wanted to open wide the doors and windows of perception. And this is a reference to Aldous Huxley's book called The Doors of Perception. Um, and then my final quote about the pier. Um, the dictatorship of General uh, Medici was at its peak. People were dead and tortured in the dungeons of repression and the former students, demonstrators, and subversives who had unsuccessfully tried to change the regime went to warm themselves in the sun like lazy lizards. The days were long and beautiful, and Ipanema was always a party. Um, so how is this possible? Um, you know, all of these people who were part of these cultural movements were, uh, were mobile. They were spending time, you know, many of them were in exile in Paris, in Rome, in London during much of this period. Um, some of them were studying at Berkeley. Um, Pasquin had foreign correspondents, right? They had a foreign correspondent in Greenwich Village. They had a guy who would send regular, write, wrote regular columns from Greenwich Village. Um, uh, Chico Buarque, another famous mu musician, was the foreign correspondent from, uh, from Rome. He wrote regular columns in Pasquin from Rome. So this is, this, is, uh, this is not some isolated place. This is a place that is integrated with the world. These people are moving around, receiving stuff from everywhere, um, and they're deploying it in their own particular struggle against the, the Brazilian dictatorship and the, the social norms of Brazil at that time. Um, and so let me say something about the post-counterculture neighborhood. Um, uh, for one thing, it, uh, and I think this is like a lot of post-countercultural neighborhoods, it, uh, Ipanema is a cosmopolitan, uh, transnational place. Um, for Brazilians, especially people in, in Rio who, who don't live in the South Zone. Uh, Ipanema is the place to go to see the world. Um, you go to Ipanema to see what the latest fashions are. You go to Ipanema with the idea that maybe you're gonna be on television. Uh, you go to Ipanema to rub shoulders with, with you know, celebrities. You know, Madonna was there last week and Alicia Keys and whoever else. Um, and of course, local celebrities, you know, soccer stars. Um, but it's, it's a place to see the world. And yet, um, from the perspective of the world, what could be more Brazilian than Ipanema? I mean, this is the, this is the view of, of Brazil that we get, is Ipanema. It's, it's the cliche image. And so um, Ipanema is a place that people have to come to when they come to Brazil. So it's this in-between sort of thing. Um, another thing that Ipanema has common with a lot of post-counterculture neighborhoods is the myth. Uh, there has been, there is a, um, a very strong myth of this period. It, it's, as you go through this neighborhood, the past is always omnipresent. It's always sort of hanging over your shoulder. And there are people who, um, who have made it their business to be myth makers. And 
To understand this, uh, just think about the cultural production of this period. Um, this, was a, this was a period that produced music, art, theater, film. Um, Pasquin was, a, was a, a laboratory for journalism. So these were, these were young cartoonists and journalists who went on to become the dominant journalists of, of Brazil, uh, or uh, certainly of Rio, um, in later periods. And so all of these people produced work that, that celebrated the period. Um, and so my second point is that there's been a certain reproduction of, of, uh, of Bohemia here, that um, people are attracted by the myth and they seek to relive this moment. Um, and there's also a certain way that culture is passed down a bit more organically. Um, as people use the spaces and interact with other people, they, they learn ways of behaving and attitudes and ways of speaking. Um, <clears throat> another common thread in, in post-Bohemian neighborhoods is uh, gentrification and commodification. Um, Ipanema is thoroughly gentrified. It is probably the most expensive place to live in, in Rio and, and probably the most desirable place to live in Rio. So uh, Bohemia has attracted uh, bourgeois Bohemians in Ipanema. Um, and there are many ways that, that, uh, that the, the history has been commodified. Here's one of them. This is the bar where um, Tom Jobim and uh, Vinicius de Moraes apparently saw some beautiful girl walking towards the beach and, and wrote the famous girl from Ipanema song. And so now it's, it's the girl from Ipanema bar. Um, but there are, there are you know, lines of clothing that, that capitalize on the Ipanema image, uh, multiple you know, music and biographies and, and retrospectives. Um, and then this is a happening place. And so anyone who wants to market something goes to Ipanema to market it. Um, and then, uh, okay, so this is my, um, th there is a, a sort of a, a bohemian culture here that in, in the small C sense, where uh, people, are, are very, people are liberal in Ipanema, people vote to the left, people have liberal attitudes, um, people are very laid back, casual, they have, very, they have a very casual sort of slang that they use to speak. Um, they're interested in uh, health food and the environment and nature. And so all the sort of things that we would associate with kind of lefty, post-hippie places. Um, and then there, the most important thing for me is that there's a tradition of use of public space in, in Ipanema that has, been, um, that has been passed down. And particularly, it's particularly clear to me in the way that people use the beach and the bar as a space of conversation, but also as a space of, of creativity. So, you know, already in the 1960s, you have these cultural producers hanging out in bars, hanging out on the beach, using public space in a certain way, and they're exchanging ideas, and they're networking, and they're brainstorming, and they're putting together uh, people to do projects on the beach, in the bars. This is something that, this is a tradition that is absolutely alive today. And so interviewing someone on the beach last year when I had the fortune of being there, um, she was telling me that she's in the, uh, in the film industry, and to put together a film, um, you know, you're on the beach and you, you find your actors and you find your, your cameramen and you find your sound people, they're all there. Um, they're, they're, it's a dense network of creative people who operate on the speech. And so I think this is one of the things that gets passed down. And I think a lot of Bohemian neighborhoods around the world have sort of a creative culture tradition that um, gets passed down. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to say something about Carnival, okay? This is the Bandaji Ipanema today. And I, this is a bit exploitative, but those are my children on the right having a close encounter with the Bandaji Ipanema. <laughs> Um, the Banji Ipanema is a, the oldest Bohemian Ipanema tradition. It has become a, a bit of a gay parade. And so the global angle here is simply that uh, I feel very much like I'm in uh, a gay pride parade in San Francisco when I, when I go to, uh, when I see the Banji Ipanema. And of course, Ipanema is, is, a, is a gay destination, um, and as are many. Um, many post Bohemian neighborhoods have become gay neighborhoods or have spin off gay neighborhoods, and that is the case of Ipanema. Um, and then, the latest thing is the booming of street carnival. So um, the Banji Ipanema was, uh, was the forerun, forerunner in 1965. In 1985, at the end of the military dictatorship, there is a new round of, of invention of street carnival in Ipanema. OK, I'm stopping. I'm stopping. <laughs> um, and it started out very small. And to this, this year in carnival, there were 3.5 million people participating in street carnival, up from 2 million last year, up from a million year before, up from a couple of thousand when I was there 10 years ago. Um, and this is something that's created on the beach. And um, anyway, so I will stop there. Thanks.
and that was great. It's, the whole afternoon is taking on an autobiographical uh, sense for me. I, I, was, I lived in Rio in about the early 70s, um, and I want to thank you, Jim, for explaining to me what was going on <laughs> around me. I, I, I looked for myself in one of those beach photos there. I would have been the, either the palest or the reddest person on the, on the beach at, 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 at that time, but it was very informative, and I look forward to discussions uh, with you, Jim, about the very serious issues, I think, that lie behind that very uh, colorful and interesting presentation. Uh, Marisa Zapata is our final speaker. Marisa has promised me she hasn't changed the title of her, her talk, which is, uh, and if she has, she it will revert back to what I'm saying it's going to be. It's a multicult multicultural participatory planning, uh, normative ideals and pragmatic realities in Monteverde, Costa Rica. So it's a, uh, a wonderfully innovative uh, case study that Marisa is going to present to us. And uh, I'll start by saying Marisa didn't go to the University of California, Berkeley. She, uh, so she brings welcome diversity in a certain respect to that. She has her PhD, I guess recently, right, uh, Marisa? Congratulations from the University of Illinois in regional planning, uh, and now is an assistant professor um, of regional planning, I suspect, at the University of Cincinnati. Yeah. So it's nice to have you. Thanks for coming, and uh, welcome, uh, Marisa. So I guess I didn't change my presentation title. It was the presentation title in the, uh, the program is different from the presentation title here, but that matches with what the discussion just read. So I think we're, we're all on board. Uh, first, I want to thank Clara for inviting me to participate in this. It's been really exciting to get back to my work in Costa Rica. I haven't been as engaged as I finished up my dissertation as I would have liked to have been. Um, I come to the table with an idea about asking questions about how we incorporate public participation in planning processes. And I fundamentally want to ask, how do we do that in our transnational and multicultural spaces? How do we create plans that reflect shared values if we can't even identify what those shared values are? And I was particularly interested in the opportunity to work in, in Costa Rica to explore how two cultural groups that were living and working together um, conceived of participation and the development of the community's first legally empowered public planning process. I was looking at differences between social groups that were shaping participatory activities in what is called the District of Monteverde. And Monteverde is a region that's located on the Pacific Slope, at the very top of the Pacific Slope in Costa Rica. It's a very small region of about 5,000 people. So again, going back to these ideas of rural areas and what's happening in them. Uh, Costa Rica was settled in the mid-1900s by Costa Rican farmers, campesinos, and expatriated United States Quakers from Alabama. So in the early 1940s, late 1950s, we were starting to see the emergence of a very multicultural transnational community. Over the years, the region would be discovered for its uh, ecodiversity, and with that would come biologists and scientists from around the world to talk about the environmental sustainability of the region. And with that has come uh, hippie movements from Argentina primarily, and as well as Western Europeans who have bought property and settled into the area. So the community is very transnational. One thing that's been very exciting today is that usually when I present on Monteverde, I feel like I'm talking about this very unique, bizarre place. And in the context of all the towns we've heard about today, Monteverde seems pretty normal, <laughs> which is an exciting and refreshing perspective. Um, what I really thought was interesting in the context of Monteverde was, again, this idea of these Quakers settling with Costa Rican campesinos and living together and how they had governed together. Um, and then specifically this idea of Quakers and what they bring to the table about consensus. And this had become an increasingly problematic term for me in the participation, participatory literature and planning. What does it mean to come to consensus? What are we asking people when we ask them to reach agreement about something? And so Quakers, as I'll talk about later, have a very particular idea of what that looks like. And it was very exciting for me to be able to see Quakers living in a community trying to reach agreement and bring people together on particular activities. Um, and then finally was this emergence of a legal empowerment for the region to actually be able to conduct a planning process and produce what is called a plan regulador, or in the United States what we would commonly refer to as a comprehensive plan or a land use plan. And this was a major achievement for the community in and of itself. So this is just a basic location map. It shows you where uh, Monteverde is in relationship to the rest of Costa Rica. This is the early settlements, 1940s and 1950s. You can see this mud road. It hasn't changed very much during the wet season. 
they used ox carts to get up the mountain. It is just as hard sometimes to get down the mountain. And this plays into why the community felt that they really needed to try to seek their own legal powers to be able to plan. Of course, we have the infamous biological and ecodiversity community that comes from Monteverde. Most notably, what put most, uh, Monteverde on the map was the discovery of that cute little guy right down there, the golden toad. He was discovered, and from there, everyone just became very excited about the interesting and different indigenous species. But with that came an interest of the entire world to see those species. Uh, Monteverde is known for having a network of private reserves to protect the land. And it's not public, so they're not run by the government. It's a network of three private reserves. One of the most famous is the Children's Eternal Rainforest. And children from Sweden banded together to send money over to Monteverde to be able to buy land and put it together and be able to save it and protect it from development. Uh, in doing so, it also created a, an interest in these Swedish children to come in the 1990s and see this beautiful rainforest that they had actually protected. So this network of reserves, this biodiversity, uh, and the tourism that eventually would grow, grow with it has become what Costa Rica has, is largely known for, and that is an eco-tourist movement and an eco-tourist agenda. Um, as that eco-tourism has grown, the region has grown as well, the population has grown, and you can see here, these are the kind of five main towns or little urban areas of the region, Los Llano, Santa Elena, Monteverde, there's a town called Monteverde, Cerro Plano, and San Luis. Santa Elena is the largest, most dense area is where most of the Costa Ricans live. So we also see some spatial se se um, segregation patterns. The town of Monteverde is where the Quakers originally settled and where most additional gringos, those gringos who come as scientists, will settle in. Cerro Plano being in the middle of the two functions that are a nice, typical urban transition area where we see some mixing of people from different backgrounds and land use patterns. Finally, San Luis is a rural area that is mostly Costa Rican and Los Llanos is another rural area that is actually primarily occupied by foreigners who own property and come in only for a short period of time. So you're getting a sense of all the different populations we have living in this region and obviously the complexities of trying to plan this region it brings up a lot of questions as to who has rights to the city, who has rights to this space to make plans for it and to support it for the future. It shows you the settlement pattern of, San, of Santa Elena and also shows you what kind of what the limited resources in which the region is working with in order to plan. It's a very basic GIS map. It's not the kind of graphics that we saw from presenters earlier. And this is student done, drawn on the fly, wearing a little headset to find their GPS locations. Uh, and that's the reality of them trying to practice. This shows you on the left the deforestation that has happened in the region. On the right, that is one of the reserves. So it's showing, it just demonstrates that yes, if the reserves are in place, we do protect them. If the reserves are not in place, then we do lose massive amounts of forest coverage to farming activities. In Monteverde, primarily the farming activity is dairy farming that was brought by the Quakers. That's what they did in Alabama, and that's what they started doing in Costa Rica as well. Uh, there's also a lot of coffee farming as well. So in addition to the threats of deforestation, with this growth in the mid, around the, in the mid 90s, um, as the tourist economy started to boom, Nicaraguans started coming into Costa Rica to try to find jobs. Other Costa Ricans started moving into the region to try to find jobs and to take advantage of these tourist opportunities. With this came unprecedented growth rates that the region cannot manage. The region itself has no local power or authority. It rests on its municipality, county, and province, all that goes by the name of Punta Arenas. Punta Arenas is geographically located on the ocean. And so it takes two and a half to three hours to get from Punta Arenas up this mud entrenched road to, Costa to, to Monteverde. And Monteverde found that they really couldn't rely on Punta Arenas to provide them any support fiscally or logistically to be able to govern their region and to try to actually make plans and enforce development codes and standards. And so some of these things we think of as being very, uh, maybe be, not being that threatening, but for the Monteverde region can be particularly threatening. So we see here some kind of haphazard development patterns. Uh, we see here the, the very friendly canopy walk, along with the ability to wear and slide, I forget what those things are called when you slide down from the trees. Anybody remember? Zipline, Zip thank you. I've never actually done one despite spending a lot of time 
in a region that has lots of them. Uh, but it's really unclear what kind of impact these kind of tourist activities have on the ecosystem and on the region itself. Uh, one of the more controversial activities I think has actually finally been stopped was a paint, paintball gun war zone. So you could pay money to go try to chase each other in the cloud forest and shoot each other with paintball guns. Uh, this is particularly important given this is a Quaker community and Quakers are pacifists. So they were not excited to see not only the forest being used as being used with an activity that might be exploiting it, but also being used to bring up these images of violence and war. Uh, the region has serious issues with gray water runoff. So you see these lovely children playing in gray water. And then finally, you see new development and buildings. These are just an example of a structure that's gone in and then increased truck traffic and vehicular traffic. It's again unclear how much impact having all of these tourist buses coming up has on the region. The largest reserve has finally put into place mechanisms to limit the number of people who go in. So if you go to Monteverde, you might not actually go to the largest and most famous reserve because they are only gonna let X number of people through the region, through that forest in any one period of time. To give you a sense of the dynamic uh, of how large this tourist population is, the tourist industry estimates anywhere from 150,000 to 250,000 people visit this region every year. 5,000 people call this place home. So we're seeing some really mass magnitudes of scale in terms of how the community is going to try to manage the growth in the tourist industry while also being able to take care of themselves. This is a project that I worked on with an institute in Monteverde and it was an idea of different ways of scenarios to, pro to project different ways that we could arrange density patterns to help address the growth issue and help manage growth issues. Um, and this was part of what kind of exemplified Monteverde up until about the mid 90s. And this was their ability to self-govern. So because the Quakers had such an influence in the area, the Quakers come from a very long tradition of self-government. The first and foremost is that they have a very important town hall meeting. People come to the town hall meeting, they have very serious debates over issues. Secondly, within that structure, they have a very binding consensus building process. If you think weak consensus exists, it doesn't exist in the Quaker community. Quakers come together, they believe that through deliberation and discussion, you can reach very important decisions together and collectively. The longest discussion and deliberation I heard about in Monteverde in the Quaker town hall meeting was four days, and that was to decide whether to build a bridge. And they debated it and deliberated it. They're very much guided by the notion of spirituality and God, and the belief that through prayer and through being together in their town hall and in their place of worship, that they will be guided to the right decision. They are so committed to this that one person can actually stop a consensus building process. So that if one person feels that this is a moral issue, that this project or decision cannot be made, they can actually choose to stop the entire project. You can also choose to do what's called stand aside, which is to simply say, I don't feel I can support this project, but I don't feel strongly enough to stop it. Which is a little like abstaining, but with a little bit more depth to it. Um, up until the mid 90s, the Quakers also really believe in committees. It's kind of a joke in the community. We're just gonna form a committee to address that problem and solve that issue. And yes, you see committees everywhere. And uh, the Costa Ricans in the region have also picked this up. So every institute, every activity, every idea has a committee that goes with it. And it's actually a place where you see a lot of interaction between Costa Ricans, uh, Quakers, gringos, environmentalists who are in the area. So the committees, form, the committees serve a purpose that goes much more beyond just how they're making decisions on a particular issue. They're actually servicing the social interaction that the community need, has needed to make a lot of decisions and creating relationships and sustaining them. Um, and can sustain these informal networks. I went on a trip to a land to visit a landowner with someone and uh, got to see one of these informal networks at play. Someone had been invited someone else over and someone tag along. We all went over. And then I got to watch the most the best part of informal networking, which is social pressure. Direct social pressure not to make a particular decision. And this is how the community's been largely focused uh, operating. In the mid-90s, the community realized they were growing too fast. The town hall meeting structure wouldn't be working, wouldn't continue to work. There had been a lot of tensions between the Quaker and the Costa Rican community, the campesinos who had been originally there. They had this new influx of populations that had come in. They were really trying to grapple with how are we going to vision for our future and how are we going to actually create policies for our future. They created a process called Monteverde 2020. They came together, they really emphasized the importance of stakeholder collaboration from a wide range of viewpoints. 
They deliberately put people at the table that didn't get along with each other to try to come up with an articulated vision and set of plans and recommendations for the future. Uh, unfortunately, one of the biggest learning outcomes for them through that process was that they had no legal authority, so what was the point? And, and that could be a whole other conversation because a lot of good things did come out of that process, but a lot of people were very frustrated and had a very hard time realizing that they in fact didn't have the legal power to enact any of these ideas. They had to depend on one another to actually follow any policies they came up with. So this really left the community thinking, okay, what we really need is ability to self-govern. So this is a picture of the uh, province of Punta Arenas. This is done by the uh, La Nacion, the national newspaper. I think it's great because number one is Punta Arenas. You can see this on the ocean. And um, Monteverde is up here. They forgot to include it in the boundary. Uh, so which kind of emphasizes that yes, Monteverde is forgotten, <laughs> both literally and physically in, in visualizations of the region. Uh, but yes, the, the area in which they were having to seek all their government and support was from down here. They recognized this wasn't working, and they fought very hard to be recognized as what is called a district or a municipal district. It required a change and a reform to the Constitution, so they fought very hard for their right to actually govern themselves. They founded a district. This is the boundaries of the district. You can see on the far right the, the massive reserve that I showed the aerial photo of earlier. In founding this district, the, one of the most important and exciting things for the community leaders who were involved in this process was to create this plan regulador, or this land use plan. Now, before I, I went down as they were discovering this process, as things were unfolding for them, and before they had actually achieved this status, everyone in the community, community members, community leaders, were very excited about this plan regulador and would say, yes, we're gonna be able to vision, we're gonna be able to talk about what our future is gonna look like, we're gonna talk about education, we're gonna talk about land use, protecting the environment, health, social inequality. You know, listing off all the things that you expect a community to hear when they hear, we're gonna do a comp plan. And unfortunately, one of the first things that the plan commission had to learn is that a plan regulador is a basic land use plan. And that's exemplified by the last few points that are defines the plan regulador. Now, the Nash, nation of Costa Rica actually sets forth all legislation related to plan regulador and dictates what it should be done and how it should be done. These are the areas in which the plan regulador has authority and the localities are expected to plan. Again, you can see this is just basic land use planning. We're looking at basic how, how are you gonna develop what are the political systems and infrastructure? Do a basic cursory study of the population, land use, circulation studies, community services, public services, housing, and where needed objectives about housing. So we're not really getting into these large visioning efforts or the larger participatory interests in which the community really had driven them to deal with this, to want to be able to do this plan regulador. Now, don't get me wrong, they were very concerned about growth management and how to address land use planning. So they were concerned about this, but it meant that in some instances they were very much problematized by how they were going to actually engage the public, make people excited about this process, while recognizing that they couldn't really do a lot about all of these other issues. And we see that as much in the United States in planning practice as we do other places. This kind of question of what are we getting the public excited about? What do we actually have legal authority to do? What can we actually create and do that's going to have teeth? The second problem that the Planning Commission faced right on was that after all of this effort to become a district and to create a plan and to have legal authority, they got hit with no, in fact, districts do not have the legal authority to fully make their plan you have to actually rely on the municipality. So as they, they had already started their planning process, they'd already hired a consultant, they'd already done all of this work, and suddenly they're being told, no, now you have to go back to Punta Arenas, and you have to deal with everything in Punta Arenas, including the party politics that every Costa Rican wanted to stay out of, because that is going to be who actually says that your plan is okay. So this was a major setback for them, and really halted their planning effort and put it, uh, put it to a standstill. This was what they were at, the point they were at when they stopped. Uh, on the right, you can see probably the most important thing, the zoning map. 
on the map of the land use policies was not enacted before their, their power to actually plan and hire their own consultant was pulled and meant that they had to actually deal with what to do next and how to go forward. And the last time I there was there, people were just pretty demoralized and feeling very down about their ability to plan locally. So what? So what's the point of all of this? Um, I was really interested in how people thought about public participation and how participation was enacted across these different cultural groups. And I really can see the participation in two ways. I looked first at the planning commission. The planning commission is appointed, it's a volunteer group, and oddly enough, it was split 50% Costa Rican and 50% Tico. And this is a very was very unusual when compared to the other commissions in the municipality where there were no gringos. Gringos were not involved anywhere except for on this commission. It was also interesting to see how they played out their roles differently. The Costa Ricans had taken on the role of party politics. Most of the gringos did not have legal voting rights in Costa Rica and really had no interest in being involved in party politics. The Costa Ricans didn't really want to be involved in party politics but recognized that's what their opportunity was, that's where their strength was, that they could actually engage and be able to make a difference. Um, the work on the Planning Commission really, I think, reveals the nuanced conceptions of identity, especially national identity, that goes on in Costa Rica as issues are being determined. Although now the Quaker and Gringo population is very small in proportion to the Costa Rican population, the history of having a Quaker community, having a white community living in Monteverde is still very prominent in a lot of the discourse. There were two discussions that really, I think, illustrated that. Um, the in leader of a new institute, a new leader came into an institute and wanted to join the, uh, join the plan commission. And the planning commission said, no, we're not going to have another gringo on this commission. We're done. And thank you. Um, and then someone said, well, she's not really gringo. She's a Philippine American. And the person, the, the Costa Ricans all said, okay, that's fine. She's not really American then. And then you know, rejected the offer of a student volunteer because she was a white gringo. In the same meeting, they rejected because the, the student was white. This also played out in my identity. Um, I was off, I've often, well, the institute that I worked through nicknamed me La Mexicana. As my Mexican friends like to point out, I'm as Mexican as a frozen burrito. But in the context of Monteverde, this idea of a nuanced identity of what it meant to be American was very much tied into a white Anglo-Saxon American. You could be anything else and be accepted into activities, but if you're a white Anglo-Saxon American, they were gonna be much more skeptical with whether they were going to involve you or not. Um, and then finally, this idea that as tensions move, as the commission moved forward, although a lot of these tensions kind of surfaced and bubbled, they weren't so pressing that the commission felt that they had to take a break and address them. Uh, two commissioners did express the concern that as they move forward from these more abstracted ideas that they would have more significant problems. I'm gonna go through these other things really fast. Um, mostly in terms of, of public participation, there was a lot of agreement. Everyone was very committed to social justice. They wanted to hear marginalized voices. Now, where they disagreed, uh, especially along uh, lines of national identity, was whether that hearing meant actually doing something. Was it enough to hear voices, or did you actually have to change the plan? Uh, and many people felt that they would like to change the plan, but recognized that they didn't have that opportunity or that luxury. And they really felt that there was a difference between educating the public over what they should be doing versus the co-creation of a plan. And Costa Ricans and campus, I mean, Quakers and campesinos really wanted to try to do this co-creation of a plan. Gringos who had moved in in the last 10 years and most Costa Ricans who had moved in in the last 10 years were like, just educate people and move forward. Uh, by the time I had gotten back to Costa Rica, most people had recognized that without public buy-in, there would be no implementation of the plan. And so that had become their most pressing concern with the aspects of public participation. They wanted people to be able to implement the plan and support the plan. Um, I think this project really illustrates the idea that we have a very complex idea of power, and I want to thank Baranak for giving me feedback actually many years ago on this paper, <laughs> uh, on this particular issue. Um, I've kind of shied away from it, and I welcome input on how to deal with this. I, this notion of power is very complex in Monteverde. People say, okay, well, the gringos can just leave. They have that ultimate pass. They might say they're invested in the community, but they can just pack up and go. So that's a very powerful card. At the same time, you look at the community and it's like, well, who cares if they go? 
they don't have that much money. They're not running a lot of the businesses. There's not that many of them left. Is that really a powerful card at this stage? Um, and then, I mean, you can see the way that, that people were recognizing what they had agency over. So Costa Ricans recognizing that they had agency over this ability to actually influence political politics, party politics, engage in their national political system. Well, gringos held a technical power. They were seen as being the experts on this land use planning process. Land use planning was from North America, so we're gonna have the gringos help us do the land use planning process. It didn't matter that none of them had ever done a land use planning process. Um, and then, I mean, as I said, the ability to actually move away. So in summary, um, I had really thought about this idea of this kind of subtleties of power and how, does, how is it influencing what's going on. This idea of participation, really wanting to ask questions about how we could do planning differently in transnational communities that you know, do our planning process actually support us understanding our opportunities, our differences and our synergies when it comes to thinking about participation and how we can actually engage it and enact it. Um, and then perhaps actually looking at different spaces to consider this. So instead of thinking of thinking that participation looks the same across the board, maybe in the plan commission, we work to do what, what uh, John Dryzak has dubbed meta consensus, or what the Quakers would consider this deep consensus building. Maybe our plan commissions are the places where we want people to go off and commune together and reach very deep intersubjective understanding on abstracted values and issues. But when we actually have public input sessions, maybe that really is more about public education and a checks and balances. So um, in some, that's really, that's really it. I'm just wanting to ask questions about how we continue to think about participation in these contexts. Thank you. Time. Do we need to cut short a little bit? Our uh, but what time shall we go to? Um, we'll take five minutes. Okay. Five minutes or five and ten. It'll get fine. I've got. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope you've enjoyed as much as I did the these presentations. Thank you, Marisa. Um, it's just as well, either I've got an hour's worth of comments or five minutes, Clara, you're right. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can work on the five-minute version just to remind us maybe what uh, we've heard uh, and, and leave 10 minutes for people to, uh, to comment. Uh, I'll start with Marisa's because it's a little bit, it's the, uh, uh, the one we have most, be, most recently in mind. I had to laugh when you talked about one person can stop the entire process, I think referring to the Quaker. Uh, uh, forms of deliberation and consensus, and I was thinking about the senator on the jobless benefits, and uh, we're, not, we're not quite so different. Uh, I want to congratulate you. It's very rich, in my judgment, ethnographic study, a very important problem in Latin America and Maurice is addressing, which is, in my mind, protecting fragile areas uh, in efforts to build sustainable tourism, which is an important source of revenue uh, for Latin America in the future. Her main interests in, in uh, this paper are in the plum, uh, uh, plumbing the, the, the limits of part, defining for us what consensus really means, consensus and this concept of meta-consensus and how important that is. And she does that by highlighting the tension between two groups, los ticos and los cuaqueros, I think they must be called. But it, it struck me as strange that the cuaqueros, first of all, what were they doing in Costa Rica to begin with? Uh, and second, why after 50 years they're still considered gringos? Um, and I'm wondering whether those uh, transnationals and the gringos that you describe and you say, well, they can always get up and leave. I guess we all have that option uh, to some extent, um, but really they've created a different sort of, for a sort of form of community. So I, I just was wondering why after all those 50 or even 60 years now, um, there is still such a distinction made uh, on racial or ethnic grounds or, or national origin. Um, uh, that was just one comment uh, uh, for me, and whether those gringos there are really building a culture, Marisa, that it's difficult to understand there, and it might be also difficult for those people to, to come back here too, and something different. Some, they have contributed, uh, contributed to an important transnationalism. Uh, in terms of the bottom line of the paper, uh, what I took from it, maybe it's more of a social science perspective, is um, how politics mattered so much at the very end, and how kind of discouraging it all was, Marisa. I know your interest was more in the participation, participation of various groups and consensus building and so forth, but 
After all that great work on the Plan Regulador, nothing really seemed to happen. Maybe I was a little discouraged about that uh, because they required uh, a consensus from the approval from the people who lived on that impossible mud road hours away, and those people couldn't agree about the time of day, much less on the Plan Regulador. So a lot of the good work uh, and, and consensus building, it seemed to me, wasn't going to lead to very much. And what does that tell us about similar efforts elsewhere, maybe less well-informed, less serious efforts uh, to protect, uh, uh, going back to the main question, protecting fragile areas in an effort to build sustainable tourism. If it can't happen there, Marisa, can it really happen uh, anywhere else? Milena Gomez has taught us a wonderful case study, I mentioned that already, uh, of the diaspora communities and where her interest is in housing and housing markets and brought a, a, a wealth of data uh, and I congratulate her for that. It would have passed without anyone noticing if she hadn't taken the time to put that data together. I guess, though, it, it sets off in my mind maybe two separate sets of questions, Melina. One, one is this kind of romantic and nostalgic, emotional appeal of what you call mi tierra, those who are born there. And by the way, the Colombian diaspora, it seems, is more of a middle-class diaspora than a the Mexican uh, diaspora or the Salvadoran diaspora or even Ecuador and the Colombia has sent uh, in middle class and they, um, uh, so the, the question I have is what, is this something that goes beyond the romantic and the nostalgic? I mean, did those people actually buy those houses? Did they actually move in? Did their children ever want to go? If they did, did they feel at home uh, or did they prefer to come back to New Jersey uh, or Long Island? Um, is there such a thing as mi tierra, ultimately, um, and, and the return home? And I didn't mean that to sound stark or melodramatic, but it's a question in my mind. And, and more generally, what your paper rises in my mind, and you and I have had the, 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 uh, uh, the opportunity to talk about this before, is how Latin American countries see their expatriate uh, uh, compatriots. They, they went from totally ignoring them, as you point out, Milena, to seeing them as, aha, a source of remittances to, aha, they can even help us in the construction industry. But how is the Latin American view of these diaspora communities emerging? Do they see them as, for example, extensions of Colombian, Mexican foreign policy? Do they see them as lobbying groups? Do they see them as ways to influence this chaotic American debate on free trade, on migration reform, on drug trafficking, and so forth? So um, your case study raises questions which, um, in my mind, which are very a great interest, and, and can Latin American governments, even if they want to use um, the diaspora communities in this way, can they really do that? Um, or once you've left and, and set down roots in this kind of rootless country of ours here, um, is, is something new been, been created? Uh, Miriam, thank you very much for your uh, paper on Cusco, and again, allow me to relive the the past um, uh, so much, uh, uh, I think I may have mentioned or, uh, um, you know, how it, uh, it, it impacted me personally. I, I, I think I mentioned already that the chicheria that with the red flag uh, indicating the chicha, I never, I never did try the chicha or what they told me was the authentic chicha after they told me how they made it. I never really did try it, but it was in other uh, surroundings than I actually have. But I noticed that the, the red chicha sign was out, but they were selling Brazilian beer there. Uh, what I think the importance to me, and everything is to me, and I may not have been the best person to interpret this complex paper, series of papers, but to me, Mirdian is showing us is there really is a middle ground between global and local. One doesn't need to burn down all the, figuratively, the Starbucks and, and close the McDonald's and, and so forth. As, maybe as appealing as that might be, um, that, isn't, that probably isn't gonna happen. Uh, there's ways in which the global and local can meet uh, and can prosper uh, together. That maybe is not the right word and it may be a little simplistic, but Cusco in your telling can become cosmopolitan in the sense of absorbing visitors and values from abroad, can meet the world head on, so to speak, without the need for protected barriers, uh, people that are coming in from outside. And I, just commented loosely, but I've thought about it since your finished remarks about how entrepreneurial and energetic the Cusqueños are, not just the ones in San Blas, but uh, the ones who live in communities throughout the, uh, that uh, very interesting city. So uh, I like very much the, the, you didn't really get a chance to develop it, how you showed us these three interrelated, interrelated processes 
you use a lot of expressions here which are not natural to me, but they're very meaningful. Rooted cosmopolitanism uh, occurring through processes of openness, you call it, valuing our own aesthetics and then spatial commitment. But you illustrate it in very interesting ways. Joan Cito and his bar and uh, 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 Dona Josefina and her arts and crafts and how you, you kind of brought those concepts alive. I, I think my comment would be, I, I'd love to see um, you think about, maybe you've already done it, extending this study of, and this concept of rooted cosmopolitanism to other locales, to be able to generalize, elaborate, test, uh, and work out possibly with anthropologists and other social scientists uh, uh, this theory of rooted cosmopolitanism, because I think it gives us a way to get beyond this idea that all tourist tourism is bad and uh, 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 is to be resisted and the locals must be protected. Uh, there are other defense mechanisms out there and new things are being created. Uh, and your paper helps, my understanding of your paper helped me to realize that. And then Jim, thank you again for your paper on Ipanema. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, bound to be interesting. Um, it struck me in, in uh, how those kind of screwball people that we saw, of whom we saw depicted in your, your slides, not your children, of course, I mean, the other people, and the, the, the ones that were dressed up in the, uh, uh, and acting kind of crazy and through the passage of time, how that unique mixture of intellectuals and artists came together, they created a unique personality, uh, something more than my mind than a Haight-Asbury or a, a Greenwich Village, and something uniquely Brazilian, and how they really changed Brazil. I mean, I think we owe those people um, a, get, a gratitude. The clowning around uh, hides the fact that they were doing this in a period of time where they could easily disappear, be taken from the streets uh, uh, for insulting the military, for sending subversive messages through the mass media, um, for being too influenced by foreign ideas or too critical of foreign ideas. You ran risks uh, in, uh, in both directions. Um, uh, they changed Brazil culturally, um, but not by being passive recipients of American jazz or the Beatles or James Taylor or Cat Stevens or the other groups, but uh, taking that in, absorbing it, and creating something uniquely beautiful and Brazilian, which they gave to the rest of the world. I mean, of course, Bossa Nova. Uh, I also mean um, um, the Cinema Novo, um, something very uniquely, uh, uh, uniquely Brazilian. Uh, came out of that. Even the irreverent bandas uh, of Ipanema were really a challenge to the overly commercialized and structured uh, squalish samba, which dominate um, uh, so much of the carnival today. So, um, and it was reminded me, you didn't, I think, mention the word here um, in your presentation, at least I don't remember you doing so, um, this kind of cannibalization. Uh, Gustoso era o meu francês, I think, is one of the Cinema Novo movies that the Brazilians were, the myth in Brazil of you kind of eating up the foreigners and your haste, your, even as you admire them and want to imitate them by their superior culture and values, you, you eat them up in the process. And uh, that was sort of a, a myth in Brazil. Hopefully it was a myth. Maybe it really wasn't something in the 1500s that anyway lost in the midst of time. But that's sort of what happens in Brazil, that this is not a, Ipanema is not a, a a, a passive recipient of foreign culture. It, it absorbed foreign culture, created something very new, changed Brazil, and I think changed the world uh, as well. And I'm uh, appreciative, uh, Jim, uh, for your saying that. The only one factor that, as a, again, as a sort of a social scientist take on it that you, I'd welcome your further thoughts on it, is all of this, this didn't take place in a vacuum. It seems Ipanema very neat and clean to us. And of course it is a, a clean uh, neighborhood and a beautiful beach and so forth. But as you know, uh, it's surrounded by outro Brasil, the, uh, the, the, the massive majority, the 70% of the Brazilian population, which lives on very low income and lives in squatter favela communities all around Ipanema. And how that has influenced the way Ipanema developed. Um, was it something that the intellectuals and artists um, in, Braz in, in uh, independent were able to sort of divorce from their reality as they focused on political trends, on global culture, on creating a Brazilian culture, or was it something that influenced uh, 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 their way they thought of themselves and, and, and what they thought they were doing? The fact that there was this kind of silently on the edge of Ipanema and of these beautiful neighborhoods, as, as in every beautiful real neighborhood, uh, there was this uh, 
um, intrusion of reality, let's say, the really the way the most Brazilians live was kind of right there in front of you, kind of that influ influenced them, how, or vice versa. Um, I don't know if that's a very coherent question, but it's uh, maybe other actors and other, others involved uh, that you didn't mention in your paper, which I think you certainly have, must have interesting insights on. Was that five minutes, Clara? <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> No, it's more than five minutes. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I think though, if you allow me, if people don't have to run off to class or, or something, if we have ten minutes, we can. Well, we we uh, owe it to our guests if we can. Oh yes, come on. And the speakers take their spots up here. Well, we, uh, and let's let's uh, see maybe a show of hands, and we'll try to organize. Um, uh, I'm gonna. Anyone else, please? We'll get we'll, uh, one over here and one over there. Uh, we'll we'll go from that and. Quite possibly what I'll let you do and, and encourage you to do is just speak up and have our speakers uh, take note of the various points rather than address to an individual speaker, although it may be appropriate for one or another. Let's hear the, the various comments. We'll start here, please. Thank you very, very much for that. I'll, if, you're, if, you're, if I was in a good, do I have consensus that we'll get some more questions? <laughs> we'll, we'll get a few more comments and then, and then be able to do them all together, please. It's nice to see that we're above on the ranking once. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I was wondering <laughs> what may be explaining that. Is it that um, the mi migrants in Miami come to Miami with higher skills and occupy higher positions in the division of labor? Or is it that they're able to save more because cost of living is lower there? Or what, what would be another alternative explanation for such difference? Time for one or two more comments, please. And any more people would like to ask and take advantage? Yes, please. Yeah, I Are those new developed areas, uh, or was that in field, or uh, is this new development? Is that suburban? Uh, was land transformation in that? Uh, I was just wondering because in some of for example, in um, in some of those cities, there was for a time, I think that in the 90s, a lot of property that was bought by uh, the narco industry and some uh, many housing was empty, right? So what has happened with that housing? Uh, what has the, the state done? I mean, then they, they have, what they have done is to redevelop more area, to not take into account the previous constructed uh, areas? I'll give an opportunity for one more question. If there's one more comment or, or, or from the uh, from the floor, don't be shy. Uh, like yes, we got one more over there. Over there, just speak up, please. Reasonably stronger than the other areas in the U.S. or at least in New York. Have you seen any differences in the remittances? Mm -hmm. Thanks for an interesting set of, of questions. Well, I've thrown out some questions, that hopefully the, uh, for, uh, one for at least each of you. Others have come from the floor. Sorry, most of them are directed toward Melina. Um, maybe Melina will will start with you, and I'm going to have to say, and then we'll just come down. Melina, you have to control maybe your answers. You've got a, maybe more than you can answer in, in just two minutes. Okay. But then I'd like to take each, each um, of you a, a two minutes to wrap up, maybe respond to what others have, uh, I, or, or the questions have been, and any other further final thoughts that you have, and we'll, we'll call it an afternoon at that point. We'll start with you, Malena. Uh, 
Okay, with reference to the question about the Miami, um, the, the immigrants in Miami come from a different background from the immigrants in New York, so it's more about class and economic than education. Um, you have a richer class, you know, the, 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 we, we, there's a saying that the, the rich in, in Bogota live in Miami and the working class lives in New York. So, um, you know, in the, I've talked to brokers in the fairs and they said that, you know, they're offering housing for $130,000. They get, they sell in Miami, but they don't even sell one in, in, in New York. So it's all about, you know, the immigrants, Colombian immigrants are, have different um, socioeconomic backgrounds and they go to different places in the U.S. Um, with reference to the question about new developments, um, yes, they're all new developments in Colombia now. Construction doesn't um, get started until 70% um, of the apartments or houses are sold. And uh, so those, those, the map depicted the new developments that have started. You know, they come to the fairs, they haven't built the buildings yet. They sell, um, they sell on, on planos, on, on uh, you know, on ideas, and then once they sell 70% of the building, then construction starts. And the issue of narcos, I thought that was really interesting, but I, all the information I got, the money isn't, isn't really going through for, for narco, you know, drug dealers, apartments, because they wouldn't be channeling the money from here um, through the account 1812 of, of, the, uh, of the bank. You know, it, they, they can just go and pay cash in Colombia. So I don't think the money's going, you know, that type of money's not going through the, the, the central bank. Um, with reference to the question of, of recession, um, the information that's available on the Banco de la República is until 2008 and the uh, middle of 2009. So according to the information at 2008, remittances were still increasing. Who knows, I just um, today got an email from the IDB saying that remittances in Latin America had decreased over the board, but I haven't seen the information from the Banco de la Republica, the central bank yet for 2009, but I'm sure it's probably, it, it kept on increasing, but who knows now. And in terms of housing, uh, the fares have done less well in the last year than they did when it was booming in 2005 and 2006, partly, um, but, but um, the, the, the construction companies have tried to diversify their interests. If they, you know, they're no longer in New York, they're selling in New Jersey. Now they've opened up a fair in, in London, so they're trying to adapt to the changing realities. Thank you very much, Malena. Okay. We can just a time, we'll turn to, to Marisa. Oh, unless you want okay. to see something else? No. Oh, no okay. Thank you very much, Malena. Marisa. Um, all right, so why were the Quakers in Costa Rica to begin with? They expatriated yeah. from the United States when we went to war in World War II and instituted the draft. They are a pacifist society, and a number of them were drafted, and when they refused to go with the draft, they were arrested and put in jail. And when they decided that they would simply leave the United States and settle in Costa Rica, who had coincidentally disbanded their military at that time. So that's how they ended up there with the pacifist community. Um, I think the question about why are distinctions still made, I think is really, really important to part of the story of the community. And it's in part because a lot of the Quakers and a lot of the gringos who have settled in the area have not chosen any level of assimilation. Um, there are people who have been living there for 60 or 70 years who still barely speak Spanish or speak Spanish with incredibly bad accents. I mean, that was one reason why I earned the nickname La Mexicana because I had a, I didn't, I don't speak Spanish as well as a lot of people, but I had a more fluent sounding accent and I had more natural Latin characteristics. Uh, and so people in Monterrey are very conscious of that. Where people have chosen to intermarry, that, those distinctions diminish greatly, but there is a degree of separation that's still maintained, and so those distinctions are very much there and part of the community. And yes, this disturbing story about politics, and it is disheartening, um, and it's, I mean, that's what planning is. Planning is about politics, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I don't know what else to say about it. It is sad, and they've worked so hard to try to mm -hmm. protect their habitat in a way that they wanted to protect it. Right. And, um, and now they're, they, they've been forced into a situation where they have to deal with national politics in a way that they don't think is beneficial. So as soon as that road is paved, uh, Marisa? The road pavement, I, I don't want to comment on the road pavement. When that happens, <laughs> though, they're going to be overwhelmed. When the road, pave, when the road is paved, it'll be overwhelmed. Okay. Jim, I'll turn to you. Okay, well, um, thanks for your comments. Um, two things that I, would, that I want to uh, respond to. So the, the thing about uh, cannibalism, this was actually in the paper that I wrote, but uh, this, is, this is a long story in Brazil. In the 1920s, uh, Brazilian intellectuals were talking about absorbing um, foreign 
art as cannibalism. And then Caetano Veloso and the Tropicalist movement very explicitly talked about this cannibalism as a metaphor for how they were absorbing the Beatles and things like that. So I, I meant to make that point, and I thank you for making it for me. <laughs> um, the second point, this is a very serious point about, about um, the contradictions, as people like to say in Brazil. The Esquerda Festiva, you say. Yeah, yeah and the Esquerda Festiva was, was, uh, was criticized for being silly uh, when there were serious issues to be, to be held. Uh, and there is a certain uh, hypocrisy here. Um, these people were, this is, this is a, an enclave neighborhood, and these people were living in a bubble like the people in Ipanema live in a bubble today. And they try, in many ways, try to ignore the poverty. Um, but they, it's sort of a liberal, what we would call liberal today, where uh, generally they are concerned about the poor and would like to improve things. But when push comes to shove, they defend, they defend themselves, defend their territories. Um, but, but this group certainly was, uh, was concerned about the poor, uh, borrowed a lot of traditions from favelas, samba music, and, uh, and of course, uh, carnival has deep roots in, in poor communities. Um, but, but I would say in practice, the poor are largely excluded from the beach, and I've written in great te detail about that. Yeah. The, the, uh, the hypocrisy is that part of the discourse about the beach is that it's democratic space and everyone is, is open to everyone. That's not the case. And I've, I've, uh, I've written in detail about how people are excluded in the beach, actually, in practice. So that's a good point. I just didn't quite know how I would fit it into this paper. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I live on like the Upper West Side in Surrey, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jim. And then Miriam. Um, well, let me uh, respond to your comment first. Uh, yes, what I'm trying to address is some of those intersections. As I was saying, the, the multiplicity of the space or the convergence. And yes, I do want to understand some of those uh, intersections in other places. In my own planning practice right now in San Francisco, I feel like we're going through a process of displacement and some form of resegregation. And one of the crucial elements to understand is how can we address the planning of some of these neighborhoods where we can address when we can where we can recognize and accept and assume some level of diversity. And I feel like in this panel, in the previous one, there's a lot of substance that can help us inform some of the frameworks that one could use to um, engage in the development of neighborhoods. Um, in terms of this, the question, thank you for the question. It's a complicated question that I, I don't know if I can respond. I would like to give it a try and then follow up over a glass of wine maybe. Uh, the queer places and sexuality, those are complex dimensions, but I, I find them fascinating, not just in terms of the actual sexual act or practice, but in the way that relates and expresses to the rest of the society and the neighborhoods. On one level, let me see if I can respond at two levels. On one level, uh, the literature on queer spaces and the way it is enacting in, in the examples that I show you, the, the fact that places can be recognized for, again, their multiplicity, it can be open and can be challenged, I find extremely useful to understand our development processes and, again, confront some of the tensions or obstacles that we have. Um, also, the, in terms of, then let me address, in terms of the, the changes in sexuality and changes in the spatial practices, uh, as I was hearing uh, my colleagues here at the table, one, sexuality is it's a serious dimension in the city. On one hand, as we know, the uh, kind of Catholic religion imposes a number of frameworks and points of reference that on one hand, uh, imposes a certain behavior, and uh, on the other hand, it kind of uh, recognizes different forms of sexuality and relationships. And in the case of, of Cusco, we have a constant tension between a very conservative sector of the population and then a sector of the population that is very open and engaged. The, the reference that she made about bricheros, bricheros, it's, it's a profession that people take very uh, respectfully and careful. These are primarily male, although more and more females are assuming this role too, uh, who assume a very indigenous identity. Even if they were not used to long hair, they, you know, they use long hair and dress in a certain way. 
and engage with uh, tourist ladies or foreign ladies who want to engage in a relationship, but this is kind of to travel around, to enjoy the place, uh, they develop short-term relationships, and that's a style. That's kind of a, in between a, a lifestyle and a business. So bricheros are important figures of the city. You can find them at bars at the plaza, and that expresses kind of one particular uh, form of sexuality at the core of tourism in in Cusco. Now, in this tension between the more formal and traditional side and the more open, uh, it doesn't go without contestation. When Andres Zuniga returned to Cusco, he, he had to deal with the police. In order to open his places, many of his customers ran into trouble and violence attacks. But there is a, still an effort to create those respectful spaces, those safe spaces for a population that had been discriminated and continues to be discriminated. One important piece that I think relates to some of the planning processes that we're talking about is that Cusqueños in the Cusqueño community is not afraid of fights. Fights are part of the process. So if you're attacked because you're queer, that doesn't stop you. That doesn't prevent you from continuing a, a particular social practice that you want to engage with. Similarly, in the planning processes that go on in Cusco, People are not afraid of confrontation, and they can yell at each other and then go and have a drink. So I think that becomes an important element in kind of acknowledging the diversity and the mix that is possible in the city of Cusco. And the, re the rest is over the glass of wine that you're going to have. I think it's wonderful. I want to give you please let's thank everybody. Nine o'clock. <laughs>